after the trailer, you'll... Okay, okay. All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn to Colossians 4. Two simple verses. We're not doing a psalm today. We're not doing a parable today. I've got some very, very exciting things to share with you today, and I can't wait. But we're going to spend the first few minutes right here in Colossians, and then I'll tell you more. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. This is the Apostle Paul, and he says to the Gentiles, God's people that were mainly Gentiles there in Colossae, he says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, to unbelievers, to people outside the family of faith, redeeming the time. Let your speech always, and he's talking about, you know, when you're interacting with the people around you that don't know our great God, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. You know, salt makes stuff taste good. You know, sometimes we get peanut butter and it doesn't have enough salt in it. So if I'm going to eat peanut butter on my apple, I put salt on that to make it taste good. I want more. I want more flavor. All right? Well, salt, God says, I want you to have more flavor in your grace toward others. Let your speech be with grace, but not only just with grace. Don't just put peanut butter on it. Salt it, too. Make it taste even better. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. And you might want to just underline that word, no. You and I need to know information. <laughs> it's not enough just to speak with grace. You've got to know what to tell people. All right? So, I want to put up the NIV translation for this, a new international version, because the, old King J or the, King James says re the new King James, our, our Bible, our standard Bible, it says redeeming the time. We need to redeem our, the time we have on earth. But I like what the NIV says. It says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, redeeming the time, making the most of every opportunity. That would be the way we would say it today. Hey, make the most of the opportunities God gives to you. Redeem the time you've got here on earth. Okay? I've told you the story a million times, but I just love the story. The great preacher D.L. Moody, whom the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago is named after, he was preaching in an evangelistic campaign, leading many people to the Lord Jesus. And what happened was uh, he was telling God's people, hey, listen, it's not enough for us just to know our God and Savior. We need to share him with other people. Last week, Tony Evans in our Bible fellowship, he preached a great message. He says, you not only need to worship God's name, you need to wear his name, you need to bear his name, you need to share his name. <laughs> Woo! Man, right there, that, that, that's, that'll preach right there. Worship his name, wear his name, bear his name, share his name. See, we need to be sharing it. Well, D.L. Moody said the same thing 100 years ago to God's people as I'm saying to you today. We need to be sharing that name. Well, a woman came up to him after his message, and she says, she said, Mr. Moody, can I speak with you? Said, sure. Mr. Moody, I don't like your way of doing evangelism. I don't like your way of doing it. And he said, oh, he said, well, he said, ma'am, can I uh, ask you a question? And she said, yes. And he said, let me ask you a question. What, what, which way do you do evangelism? Do you have a way of doing evangelism? And she said, no. And he says, well, I think I like my way of doing evangelism better than your way of not doing it. So what I'd like to do today for the first 10 or 15 minutes and I always say that, and it's like 35 minutes. But anyway, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, I want to just talk about Colossians here. I want to give you qualities that we need to have so we can wear the name, bear the name, share the name. We need these qualities as God's people. Listen, you know what, everybody? God could do amazing things through this body. You know what we've got here? We've got good Bible students here. We've got people that love the Lord with all their heart. You wouldn't be here. This remnant of people that are here this morning, this group of people, the group in the children's church, the group in the Spanish church, 
I suppose there's maybe 100, 150 people here. I don't know what the total number is, including all the kiddos. But all that to say is, this seemingly small group of people, you know what, we could turn the world upside down just right here. Listen, if everybody in here reached one more person, suddenly our congregation would double. If you could just bring one person, even next week, bring them. So you get the idea. It doesn't take a lot to do the things that we sing about every week. You know, a lot of times we get discouraged and we think we can't do anything. Yes, you, we, yes we can, and yes, you can. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. And then I'm going to tell you about an amazing opportunity that God is going to set before us between now and the beginning of April, Palm Sunday, the Easter Sunday. I want to share with you something that could turn our church upside down if we let God use us. Okay, and that's the title I've given today. I want to talk to you about an amazing opportunity. But first we're going to look at these qualities, and then I'll get to that amazing opportunity, okay? So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we bow before you today, and we ask that you'll give us ears to hear. Lord, so often this world around us, it, it, uh, it gets into our minds, and it kind of hypnotizes us. It keeps us from hearing what God Almighty has to say to us on a given Sunday. So Lord, help us to put everything aside just for a moment today and hear what the Spirit says to the church. Lord, we need your grace and help, and we cling to you today for your help. And we pray it in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now, I remember back in the late 80s, I was given an opportunity. I don't remember how I got this opportunity, but a class, a religion class at Richland College, no, it's not a Christian college, it's a secular college, they asked me to come, and each week they were having a different faith clergyman, pastor, imam, whatever the religion was. They had a Muslim come, they had a Jewish man, a rabbi come, they had me come, but they were asking us to come and give our view. Like, I was supposed to present the Christian view of divorce and remarriage. Okay, so no problem. I can take Jesus' words and share it with these people. So anyway, there was a really good class there of college students, younger people, and then uh, uh, 30-somethings as well, and even some 40-somethings there. And uh, so I started to share the words of Jesus. I thanked them for having me there. And, and, but you know what? They really didn't like what I had to say. I wasn't surprised. They just didn't like what Jesus said. They felt that was being too hard and that God had a too high of a standard and things like that. Well, anyway, one lady really got angry at me. And she came up and talked to me afterwards. And boy, she had her finger up in my face and she was letting me have it. And, you know, I was just standing there and enjoying every moment. And uh, anyway, she was letting me have it. And so I said, okay, well, I said, uh, you know, I appreciate your input, and, uh, and I'll, I'll definitely think about what you have to say. And so I started walking out, and then, you know what? She wasn't finished. So she kept following me. And I'm like, huh? And, you know, she's walking behind me with her fingers still. And, blah, 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 blah. and then I got all the way out to my car, and she's still giving me the, reading me the riot act, you know? And so finally, you know, she ran out of stuff to say, I guess, and she finally just stopped. And I... And you know what, Gerald? Yeah, but you know what, Gerald? You know what I first thing I said to her was? After she stopped, and she's just standing there, you know, two feet away from me, and it was dark outside, the, the, the lights were bright in the parking lot, I just looked at her eyeball to eyeball, and I said, I said, you know what? I said, somebody has really hurt you very deeply, haven't they? And no kidding. She went from raging maniac, she just burst out in tears and just sobbed. She just burst out in tears and began to sob uncontrollably. Like, I'm like, oh my goodness, now I've got another, I've opened another. I had her yelling at me, now she's going to be crying for two hours, you know. So anyway, but anyway, I tried to comfort her and say, hey, listen, you know, this is what Christianity is all about. And you can be healed, and you can be forgiven. And so I tried to be a good witness to her. And, but that was so many years ago. And 
One of the things I jotted in my notes here is that if we will reach the people we rub shoulders with, we need to have some good qualities in our life. And let's look at these from this, these, two pa these two verses. I'm going to start with verse 6, and then I'm going to jump back to verse 5. And I have a reason for the madness, okay? So if we will reach the people we rub shoulders with, we will need to be people of grace. Jesus was full of grace and truth. He had a perfect balance. He wasn't so overwhelmed with grace that he said, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right, that's... You know what? A God that only says, that's all right, that's all right, that's not balanced. You don't see God clearly because he's full of grace. Jesus told the woman that was taken in adultery, you know, uh, your sins are forgiven, but then he said, go and sin no more. He balanced it with truth. He said, where, ma'am, where are your accusers? No, no one, Lord. Go and sin no more. Grace and truth. He gave her a good word. Go and sin no more. He told other people. He told this one guy, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come on you. And I think the dude was blind. Now, look, I don't know what worse thing can come on you than being blind, but I guess being blind with no legs or something, I guess. But he said, listen, I've healed you. Go and sin no more, lest something worse come on you. In other words, he's telling him, listen, I've forgiven you, but if you go back to living the way you were living, okay, so Jesus was full of grace and truth. But listen, everybody, Christians in the world around us, they, uh, in secular people's minds, in academics' minds, they see Christians as a bunch of blowhards and they, they really don't care about people. Man, if they really cared about the world, they'd be concerned about global warming, they'd be concerned about the poor, they'd be concerned about all the, the troubles in the world, you know. They, the Christians don't connect with that, they don't, you know, and they have all these things that they say about Christian people. So we need to come across to people as people of grace, okay? Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. That's a word picture that it should have just good flavor to it. Just, you know, a steak is great, but there's nothing better than a steak with a nice layer of salt on that. You put it on there, oh, it just tastes so good. All right, now if you are taking things because of your salt and everything, don't listen to me. Okay, but anyway, don't eat too much salt. Okay, that's bad, but anyway, but we got to have the seasoned with salt, not covered with salt, seasoned with salt. Okay, okay so that's the first quality. Next quality, everybody, is in verse 6 as well. And it's the end of verse 6, and that is skill. We need grace, but we need skill. We need people that can basically interact with people around us that don't know diddly squat about God. We need skill. Look at what the word is there. I had you circle it earlier, that you may know. Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. You need to know stuff. Peter says that uh, you need to defend be ready always to give an answer. That word answer is apologia, where you get the word apologetics. Be ready to give an apology. Be, in other words, a defense. That Greek word apology meant to defend the faith. Be ready to give an answer. Be ready to give a defense to all those who ask you the reason of your hope. Why are you so happy? Why are, why are you never, when thing, bad things happen to you, you don't let it get you to you? Why? Why? Or they might say, why does God allow evil and suffering? They might ask you hard questions. You need to know how you ought to answer each one. So everybody, we need some intelligence. Okay? You need to be ready. Now, if you're not, listen, you can be ready this way. If somebody answers, asks you a question that you don't know the answer, just say something like this. This is what I do. If I don't know the answer, I just say, you know what, that's a fantastic question. That's an excellent question. And right now, I don't really know how to answer that, but I'll tell you what, give me a few days, I'll get back with you. That's simple, anybody can, so you don't have to be afraid. I'm so afraid to talk to people because they'll ask me things I don't know. So what? I don't know the answer to questions either sometimes, but what you do is you just say, hey, listen, that's a great question. Let me come back and answer that for you, okay? So you need grace, you need skill, and then finally, if we're gonna be, if we're gonna reach the people we rub shoulders with, we're gonna need to be people, of, be, we need to be people of grace, skill, and then also wisdom as well as urgency, and that's in verse five. Those two qualities are in that same verse as well. Two in verse six, 
2 and verse 5, and now I'm going backwards. It says, be wise in the way you act toward others. Our New King James says, uh, walk with wisdom. Walk means how you behave. Walk with wisdom. Behave with wisdom, or be wise in the way you act toward unbelievers, toward outsiders. Be wise, be wise, be wise. Don't ever give them an excuse to want to reject God, either by how you speak of other people, how you talk about other. you know what I mean? There's so many ways, as people that know we're saved, know we're Christians, that you give them an excuse for not thinking about or connecting with God. So first is wisdom, the quality of wisdom. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. And then the urgency, redeeming the time. Make the most of every opportunity. All right? Make the most of every opportunity. Um, Jesus said this. He said, night is coming when no one can work. Listen, one day we're going to die or the Lord's going to return and the rapture is going to take place and the night of the tribulation period is going to descend on mankind. One day, our ability to witness will be over. Now, it might continue on and things that we've done and people we've reached and things like that, but our personally... Jesus even knew for himself that there was coming a time when he could not work personally. And that's why he said, I'm going to send the Spirit. And I'm going to work through all of you because of the Spirit that dwells in you. All right? So, grace, our words full of grace, seasoned with salt. You say, Pastor Bob, what does seasoned with salt mean? Agreeable words. Agreeable words. Words that are kind, make sense, so on and so forth. Uh, skill, that you know what to say to people, wisdom, being wise in how you act, and then making the most of every opportunity, urgency. You know what? We've been praying a long time, and it's always a blessing in our men's prayer breakfast. We've been praying for some people for years to get saved. And you know what? It's always a blessing when we hear about one of them getting saved. This, yesterday, Gary Crabtree shared how a couple that have come to the movie night here and Gary, they live a ways away, don't they? Where do they live? Or do they, do they live uh, nearby or, or Todd and... Okay, now they live in Rowlett. Okay. Well, they, uh, I think they had before lived a ways away. But anyway, this couple that came to one of our movie nights, God's Not Dead movie nights, I believe, or one of the magic shows we've had, listen, Gary just told me that now they uh, are going to church. Gary knows Teresa's father, right, Gary? Teresa's father, and he's been here too. Now, he likes to go and golf on Sundays, and Gary's working on that as well. But anyway, he's, she, Gary said yesterday that he believes that Teresa and Todd have gotten saved. We've been praying for them. At our movie night and things, we planted seeds in their hearts about God, but now they're going to Bible study together, and some great things are happening in their heart and life. You know, that's exciting. That's fantastic. Okay, now, you're sitting there saying, okay, Pastor Bob, your 10 minutes are up. In fact, you went 15. But anyway, no, I only went 10. But anyway, what is this about this amazing opportunity? What is it? What, are, what do we have before us as a church? Okay, I want to tell you about something that happened this past Monday. I was given in an email what's an opportunity to pre-screen a movie. Pastors, church workers... Kelly and I went Monday night all the way over here in Mesquite to AMC, and we didn't even know it, but Teresa and Naomi w went as well. And they were sitting one row ahead of us, about five seats down, and we didn't know it till the movie was over. Kelly said, Teresa, and Teresa turned around and went, oh, 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 because she's like, what are you guys doing there? Anyway, but it was so cool, and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad. I'm not the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm glad you guys were here, too. But anyway, because this was amazing. You say, what is it? Well, in the past, my, my life group at least, and I think I've even done a series on this years ago from the pulpit, but The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel, in 1979, 1978, he was 
an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He grew up his entire life as an atheist. The home he grew up in, atheistic. He is atheistic. Now he's a 20-something guy. He's in his 20s. And he uh, is getting promoted. He had this one story come out that was so amazing and so life-changing that when it broke, it was an amazing, amazing investigative report, and they raised him up, way, way up in the, in the pecking order at the Chicago Tribune. Well, you know what? He, uh, everything was going great for him and his family until one day his wife went and did the unthinkable. She started seeking God. And she started going to a church that's like our church, that's reaching out to people and witnessing the people. And she gets saved. And she comes home and very kindly and very graciously, she's trying to tell her atheistic husband about this. Well, anyway, we got to see this movie. It doesn't come out till two days before Palm Sunday, which is April 7th. But the reason we got to pre-screen it, all these pastors and church workers, it was a, the whole theater was filled with pastors and church workers. The reason that that we got to see it is because they said, listen, everybody, we want you to see what an amazing tool that God is giving the church, that your people, they can get people that have never, ever, that would never, ever darken the door of a church. Maybe they're even atheists or agnostics, friends, family, or they're just, maybe they're just unsaved. They're they're your family members, and they might even go to church, but they're just lost. They're unsaved. They go to church. They punch in one hour a week for God, and when they're outside of that church, they're living like the devil, okay? They don't, it's, it's only one hour a week. God doesn't mean anything outside of the church walls. Well, listen, God has given us this opportunity. A lot of people that won't come into a church, they will go to a movie. And you know what? Some of you might be sitting there and say, well, you know what? I don't have the money to go to the movies. And I, on top of that, I don't have the money to, to pay for these people's tickets. I want to invite a couple or I want to invite a family. And I can't, there's no way I can pay the whole tamale there. Well, listen, we're going to try to do all we can so that everybody that wants to go to this can go. One way or another, we're going to raise that money. And secondly, um, you know, uh, and help you even get tickets to help others. Now, if you can pay for it, great, and more power to you. But if you can't, and that's the only thing holding you back, don't let that hold you back, okay? We're going to take care of that somehow, some way. Uh, we'll, we'll try to, to do something. So if you want to invite six people, we can get those tickets. And right now, I don't even know how much the tickets are, but I'm figuring they're probably around either below or a little bit above $10 each. But don't worry about money. I want you to worry about souls, okay? Because we'll raise the money. But you know what I would, how awesome would it be to see 50 Ridgepoint people or 75 Ridgepoint people invite 75 more people or invite 150? What if you invited a couple to come with you? That means our church, let's say 75 people signed up to do this, that means. 150 people would be coming on one night to hear the gospel like incredible. In fact, you're going to get to see a five-minute clip. Thank you very much. Not that I pulled my iPhone out and filmed it illegally. I didn't do that. What I did is I downloaded, they had a digital download for $54, and it's got the whole package deal for the whole series. In fact, starting on Easter Sunday, the game plan is, the game plan is, is to invite people to the movie before Palm Sunday, and then I'm going to start a four-week series on Easter Sunday called The Case for Christ. 
And we're going to try to invite as many friends, family, co-workers. Every week, they're going to not only hear reasons to get saved, but they're going to have an opportunity to get saved. Folks, we've got to just, listen, we're singing about it with all of our hearts. You and I just need a tool to be able to put our toe in the water. We just need someone. Hey, it's hard just to come out in the blue and, quit and start talking to somebody. But you know what? It's not hard to invite people to the movies, especially if you're buying their ticket. Wow. It's hard to pass up. So we're going to help one another, okay? We're going to do something amazing here. You start thinking of family members, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uh, somebody. You all need to be thinking about at least one person you can get in, maybe 10 people. You say, Pastor Bob, can you buy 10 tickets? I don't know how we'll do it, but we'll do it. Man, if somebody here says, I'll get 10 people there, I'll go knock on Gerald's door, Bill's door, Rodney's door. We'll raise $100 and get 10 tickets. You know what I'm saying? We'll figure out a way. We'll have Gerald, he'll, we'll, have you, uh, we'll have you sell your house again. You know, you can mortgage your house. Okay, so this amazing opportunity, okay? What, let me give you some things here, and then we'll show, we'll show you the trailer, and then I'm going to have Teresa come up and tell them what, what, how it affected her, okay? Because she was sitting there. It's a true story about Lee Strobel, about an atheist who comes to Jesus. It's extremely moving, extremely. I read on the internet, some guy said about it, it's not a cringe. He said it's a cringe-free movie for, for God's honor. What do you mean by cringe-free? Well, a lot of Christian movies, they kind of have, they kind of get corny sometimes. And if you bring an atheist, the atheist just goes, there's no cringing in this movie for the people you bring. They're not going, corny, this, is, this doesn't really happen. No, no, no. You're seeing something that truly happened 25, 30 years ago, 30-some years ago. It's a true story, extremely moving. It answers questions unbelievers are asking, and it can bring people to Christ. It can bring people to Christ. I mean, Lee Strobel sitting on the couch with his wife, and he tries for two years to say, the Bible's not true, God's not real, Jesus didn't die on the cross, and finally God slays him. The Word of God slays his heart, and he's sitting on the couch with his wife, and he gets saved. He says, I believe. And listen, it's glorious. So let me just say, Robert, can you fire that trailer up? Go ahead. I'm going to talk until it appears up here. But anyway, it's not just a good movie, everybody. It's a fantastic movie. Everything that's done, I'm going to show you a five-minute clip. But first, I want to show you the trailer. You know, like when you go and see a trailer? Oh, the lights are off. Okay, can you rewind that now, Robert? I spent my entire career as a journalist uncovering the truth until the day my wife presented me with the biggest story of my life. I'm not going to lose my what? Okay, I'm going to have him back it up because it was dark at the beginning. Okay. Jiggle it. You've got to my jiggle it. <laughs> there you go. Somebody want to do an investigation into Christianity. Where would you start? If the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, it's a house of cards. You sure you want to give me that loaded gun? I'm pretty sure you're not going to be able to pull the trigger. I spent my entire career as a journalist uncovering the truth. Until the day my wife presented me with the biggest story of my life. I'm not going to lose my wife and my kids to something that I can't even reason with. And what happened next? Forever. How can we even talk about historical evidence for the resurrection? The Gospels are filled with contradiction. The empty tomb is based on evidence. And is it evidence you're trade? We all bet our lives on something. The question is, what's it going to be? As much as I would like to help out a fellow skeptic, what you're proposing is impossible. Could Jesus survive being spiked to the cross? There is no evidence to anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Just because I write something down when I bury in the dirt, it doesn't make it true. But I felt it was something more real than anything I've ever felt in my life. 
I'm praying for you. Do you really want to know the truth, or is your mind already made up? Stop blaming me and the church and God and do your job. It's really, really good. Teresa's going to come, and she's going to share her testimony about the movie. You know, I've shared this with you guys before. I grew up in the church, so faith was easy for me. I didn't have to be convinced, for, you know, that Jesus was the way. That was, I went to Christian school. We went to church on Sunday, so six days a week, it was right here in front of me. So I don't know another way to look at it. But my husband is very skeptical, and so his story of faith is very different from mine. He had to, there had to be some different kind of convincing for him, and mm. Lee Strobel was the same. You know, he went out and was trying to prove that there was no God because he didn't want to lose his wife to this uh, fanatical cult. <laughs> cult. Yeah, he called it a cult. So... Everything he went after, it wasn't just one evidence there. It was a mountain of evidence against what he was trying to find. And so it was just one thing after the other after the other. He just got disproved that God was there showing him. And it took him a while, but finally he got to where it was like there's just no other decision than, than God's real. <laughs> and that, that story is real. So... Um, watching that, I thought, gosh, this is going to be great. Because like Bob was saying, this movie, you know, you watch Christian films in your life. We love the movies. You know, I grew up poor. So what did we do? We watched the movies because we, we didn't have any money to do anything else. So we love the movies as a family. And so I um, will watch a Christian film and go, ugh. Why do they have to do that? Or why didn't they put a little bit more money in their production to make it, you know, you know, glossier? But this one is fantastic. There's people on the screen that you know their faces if you watch any of the movies. And so I think it's going to be such an awesome tool for people who try to call us a cult and how we're just blind and dumb for following the Lord. Because that's Satan's lie, isn't it? That mm. we um, are following this word that is full of contradictions and it's too old to be relevant. And uh, Christ, yeah, well, he probably lived, but he probably didn't die and all of that. I mean, all of that, he yeah. goes through all of that in the film. But one thing the guy um, was talking about after the movie was over, he kind of talked for a little bit. He was talking about how important it is for us as believers to go out and support these types of films in the box office. It's going to be in a thousand uh, theaters across the nation. And it's important for us to put our money behind that because it does say something to the world. Um, I looked up a couple of films, but Fifty Shades of Grey, which is... I've not seen that movie, so I don't know. But I saw plenty of the previews, so I, I think most of you know which movie that is. Worldwide, it grossed $282 million. In the United States alone, it grossed $81 million on its opening weekend. So that's evident of the world. But it's important for us to go out and put our money behind films like this because it makes them sit up and take notice. You know, after the Passion of the Christ, I think, you know, you saw some uh, TV films that were kind of along those lines, and then they did Noah and stuff like that, but sometimes they get a little bit off of the scripture when it comes to the story. But it 
was so amazing to watch Lee's story unfold in front of you. Because I've read, I mean, I know some of you have read the book, I've read the book, but to watch it on film makes it, you know, a little bit more real to you in your, in your brain. And I, I was telling Bob, I was, it, I was getting ready to text him too, which was so funny. I was sitting there, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's talking, I'm gonna text Bob. And all of a sudden I hear Kelly's voice and I turn, I'm like, oh. <laughs> There, there they are. But it's going to be such a great tool to use for people. I mean, I could think of three names right off the top of my head that I can encourage to watch this movie, and maybe they won't be reluctant. Oh, they've been reluctant to come in these, into this building because they think it might fall down if they step <laughs> foot in here. But a movie, they will they'll watch it because it's entertainment, and there's no pressure, you know, on them to do that. So I think the Lord's gonna use this in a mighty way and he needs the feet on the ground to put it out. So I encourage you to, to watch it and, and to pray about it, pray for us as we go through the series. All right, thank you, Teresa. All right, Robert, you have that next uh, five minute clip ready. Um, let me just say this, uh, just before he puts that up there. Um, Robert, let me go ahead and put those, uh, that one uh, PowerPoint up there about our opportunity. Um, let's see, it's before this, okay, sure, oh, okay, okay, are you jumping to it, brother, okay, All right, just before we watch the five-minute video clip, here's our opportunity. Here's our opportunity. First, our opportunity is to invite, okay? This is probably either going to be Friday night, April 7th, or Saturday night, April 8th, or it could even be Sunday night, April 9th, one of those three evenings. Now, the negative about Sunday night, and it's not a problem, but if you can't make it to one of the first two nights, I hope that you can, we can, I still have to find out about, because there's going to be tons of Christians vying for these three nights. There's not that many movies and openings, and there's only so many seats. So I hope that we can get in there, at least somewhere in, in the week before Easter. But I really would love for us either Friday night or Saturday night as a church family to be able to be inviting people. Uh, Sunday night, I have to leave the week before Easter. I have to leave to go to Virginia for my doctoral class that week. I'm going to be presenting out there. But numero uno, you need to start thinking, who am I going to invite? Now, of course, I hope you're just saying, hey, listen, I am going to take part in this. I'm going to, some way, somehow, I'm going to get involved in this. I'm going to quit making excuses. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get involved, okay? So first, you got to think of who you're going to invite to the movie. Second, and the next month, we got a month to be praying as a church, so be praying about this continually. And third, what you're wanting to do is those people that come to see the movie, of course you want to invite people on Easter, but on Easter, um, I guess, you know, what, what's interesting is a lot of times on Easter, our church has less people. You know, our church goes down on Easter. I guess the reason is, they're getting invited to all the other churches with family members or something, but our Easter, we're really going to need for you to work with us here and be here and bring your friends that just went to that movie because you can tell them, hey, you know what? Our pastor is going to be starting a four-week sermon series on the case for Christ and answering questions the movie brings up and things like that. Okay? And so now Robert's going to show this video clip, and let me introduce this. This movie, the movie clip's about four minutes, five minutes long. In this clip from the movie, which takes place in the early 80s, Lee Strobel travels from Chicago to Los Angeles to speak with one of the, most, one of the foremost research scientists in the world, who is also a medical doctor. And he asks him, he asks him about Jesus' death on the cross. He's been for maybe like now a year and a half trying to disprove the Bible. And so he's going to try to prove now, he's going to go see this doctor and say, please tell me that as an academic, as a scientist, as a research, a person of research, please tell me that as a medical professional, Jesus did not actually die. Please tell me that he just passed out on the cross. 
okay? Please prove to me medically that he didn't die, okay? That's why he travels all the way, because he's got to get an answer. Because you know why? Because if he can prove Jesus didn't die, he can prove that he didn't rise. Okay, so let's watch this. This is a really great clip here. I said, forgive me. Lee Strobel was reading something on a microfilm at the library, and he saw this doctor's name, and he says, I need to... Lights, Someone please. rings me up and says he wants to dispute the most significant event in human history. I feel it's important that we do it face to face. Don't you? Yeah, that's fine. I, uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Right. So we're uh, just doing some research on the effect of stress on the hormone levels in mice. It's an ongoing project of ours. But I assure you, you shall have my undivided attention. <clears throat> okay, I'm, then I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so my line of attack is this. The reason the eyewitnesses were able to see Jesus on the cross. Because if he doesn't die, there's no resurrection. Right? That's right. So, so whether or not Jesus himself or... Uh, or in death, it doesn't matter. It completely discounts every aspect of the resurrection. Right, the swoon theory. Yeah, when you passed out, you didn't die. You heard there's a long line of skeptics in front of you with that hypothesis. Oh, who also don't believe that Jesus died on the cross because the Quran says so. With all due respect to Islam, the Quran was written six centuries after Christ. I prefer my historical sources a bit closer to that. I understand, but, but you can see that it's possible. Mm. <laughs> Mr. Strobel, I am... A medical doctor and a scientist, I have seen a great many strange phenomena in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But the swim theory is rubbish. <laughs> rubbish. That's a, is that a, a medical opinion? <laughs> you know, it is, actually. Um, swim theorists tend to skim over the fact that Jesus was flogged prior to his crucifixion. Do you know what happens in a room of flogging? Um, yeah, the person is lashed with a whip. No, not lashed. Scourged and pummeled savagely. You see, the, the gallied whip is braided with metal balls and bone fragments. The flesh on Jesus' back would have been shredded, laid open to exposure. The flogging itself would have left Jesus in critical condition for massive blood loss, which is why he collapsed under the weight of the cross that the Romans made him carry for time. Okay, so is it possible that Jesus survived. Survivor, but it's child's play compared to what comes next in a crucifixion. Slow, agonizing death by asphyxiation. Mr. Strobel, the crucifixion of Jesus is one of the best attested events in the ancient world. There is no way ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Oh. And, if you will, the final nail in the coffin of this woman theory is this. When the soldiers thrust their spear between Jesus' ribs, do you know what came out? Blood and water. Which we now know is a that one could faint. And so to answer your question, yes, it is my medical opinion that Jesus Christ died on that cross. Doctor? But, but, but I, got a, I got a real problem with most of the experts that I've which is that most of them are not impartial. And if I'm going to take a yes, I would say that you are not either. Correct, sir. Though I have learned that most impartial travelers who undertake this journey rarely remain so. However, I can refer you to one of the most impartial sources that I know. Would you trust the journal? A scientific journal, you and I will admit that. On the physical death of Jesus. <clears throat> Clearly the way of the medical and historical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. A corpse did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Doc, I gotta tell you, you're, uh, you're not telling me what I hope to hear today.
Sorry about the lag. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't know why the equipment we got back there, it, it just lagged for some reason, both in the earlier clip and this later one. But you get the gist of the idea. Lee Strobel keeps going to these experts throughout the movie because he thinks, man, these are the smartest people in the world. And he keeps getting basically slapped down by medical experts, by experts in linguistics, languages. And listen, finally he just says, I can't disprove this. This is true. This is true. And, and he gets saved. So it's an amazing, amazing movie. And, and again, with the, with the sound being out of sync, it kind of takes away from, the, from its power. But listen, that's just four minutes of a very, very powerful movie. It's like that over and over again. There's some very suspenseful things where Lee and his daughter... I mean, Lee and his uh, wife almost lose a daughter and some different things that really make the movie powerful. And uh, so, I had a little um, screen, uh, slide here, and I'm going to pray in just a moment. But what I want to ask you to do is pray for God to bring people and to open doors and bring people. Okay? Pray, first of all, for God to bring people and to open doors and bring people, okay? I don't know if words got cut out up there or what happened there, but that sounds really kind of strange. <laughs> Did I write that? <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the first thing. And then, um, and then, let's see, what's the next slide here? At the beginning of January, I preached a sermon from Joshua, Be Strong. Be courageous, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Okay? That's so easy for us to do. But we can't, everybody. We've got to, remember I said earlier in Colossians, we've got to be wise, skillful, and urgent. We have to be urgent. We've got to say, hey, God can use me. I might not be able to get up and preach a sermon, but man, I sure can invite people and bring them with me. Someone, somewhere, somehow. Okay? So I need you to help us. You know, hey, how many of you out here want to see our church growing and, and reaching people? All of us, right? All of us. But you know what? That means all of us have to take part. Okay? That means I have to take part in this, and I need to get people here. Now, again, if for whatever reason you can't do this, hey, I'm not going to hold it against anybody. I'm not going to be checking up who's doing it, who's not doing it. But I, I'm trying to encourage you all to say, hey, I can do this. Now, for sure, listen, you ought, if you don't get anybody to come with you, you ought to be coming yourself. You know, if we get a certain night that we're going to get a big lot of tickets, I already just started off by asking them for 25. I'm hoping we need 200. But I, I started off, and they're supposed to get back with me and interact about things, and we'll know more about the date and time and all that. But all that to say, everybody, this is an amazing, amazing tool. I can't tell you. I came out of that theater walking on water. And so did Kelly and Teresa and Naomi. It's incredible. It's powerful, especially on the big screen where you got this massive screen and, and the scriptures and just, oh, it's just amazing. So, again, everybody, what I need, what I need you to do is, um, is to, um, to be praying, and I want us to have a time of prayer right now. I want us to have a time of prayer. In fact, if you want to come right up here and pray, let's get in a little circle. Others of you, if you want to come up here and sit on the front pew, you can do that. But let's just have a time of church prayer right now at the front up here. Come on down if you can. If not, you can come and sit on the front pew. But just kind of line up along the front here, and we're going to have a word of prayer together as a church to anoint this, initiate that. Come forward all the way up here, everybody, up to the st first step up here. Come up to all the way to the first step. So other people can sit on the front row. All right. Good. Come on. Go all the way across the front here. If you need to sit on the front row, sit on the front row. But just in a second, we'll join hands and, yes, stand here with us or sit there. Great. Main important thing is our hearts are connected on this. And again, like I said, we're a, we're a church of God's grace. We don't force you to do these things. We just ask you to take part somehow, some way. Um, we would never force you or look down on you if you didn't. 
But you know what? I think that all of us have a hunger to see God do more. I know I do, and I think most of you do. You're just hungering to see people get saved and God's power transform their life. And so I want to be a good leader and, and lead you down a path and encourage you. And, um, and really, that's mostly all I can do. But you know what? With God's help and with his power, God can do amazing things. And so let's bow our heads for prayer, everybody. If you want to hold hands, you want to join hands with the person next to you, that's fine. Father in heaven, we bow before you today and we just bathe our church, bathe this opportunity in prayer. In the next few weeks, we're going to be saying more about this, Lord. And so, Lord, right now, we're just getting the ball rolling. We're hungry, Lord. We don't want things as usual, Lord, here at Ridgepoint. We don't want to just... Uh, just gather together as your people, as great as it is, and as much as we enjoy being with each other, Lord, Lord, we also, we want to encourage each other, but we also want to bring people to you, Lord. Lord, people we work with, people that are our friends, people we've known a long time, and for whatever reason we haven't been able to get to open up or to get the right moment to open the door, Lord, you can help us. And Lord, we cry out to you, we hunger, Lord, we beg you, Lord, to do something great here, Lord. And so, Lord, we just bow ourselves down before you, and we pray that in these next two months, Lord, you'll do an amazing, amazing work. By the time, by the time April ends, we'll have finished the series on A Case for Christ. Two months from today, we'll be probably on the last message. And Lord, how we pray that because of our efforts, people will be sitting here with us, rejoicing that they had gotten saved, getting baptized, following you, rejoicing, Lord, because we planted seeds. Lord, we all recognize, Lord, how frail we are. And Lord, really, how often we're afraid. We don't want to fail, so a lot of times we don't try anything, Lord. So Lord, help us. Help us to see you. Help us to serve you. Help us to wear your name, to bear your name, and to share your name, Lord. And we pray it in your precious name, Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. All right, have a wonderful week, everybody, and we'll see you at Life Group this Wednesday night and Wednesday morning. <laughs> Thank you.